uh, some people are actually to organize to to invite me yeah, to, to deal with uh, this uh, house farming kind of section. And uh, thank you uh, to thank you guys. Uh, and, and thank you to, to the people that uh, have today with me here in this place. It's a wonderful place. Uh, <coughs> just uh, as we have uh, our time, uh, I, I'm gonna go to just uh, some a few words about uh, the people that uh, are together with me today. And uh, so, uh, let me introduce you first of all. Sorry about uh, my pronunciation on on Indian uh, words, uh, Indian names, because uh, I found it very, very, very difficult to pronounce. So, uh, so I will try to do it my best just in doing that. Uh, so the first uh, <coughs> person just on the table is the William Cena. So uh, he's, uh, he was the founder of a very, very interesting company called uh, Uware. So Uware later on was uh, just uh, taken by uh, Lycos. So Lycos is, is, uh, is a company very well known in Spain because uh, many years ago, Telefonica did uh, uh, just uh, try to, to enter into, into the internet uh, activities and, and then they bought like of uh, just uh, something like uh, 20 years ago. So, uh, Gurunjan is, uh, is a very well known person in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, he has been in the board of uh, many companies and, uh, and just to say that uh, he's one of the 13 Indian American people included in the in the Australian city as an American business people. So uh, later on he will he will explain to us uh, how he sees uh, India from from this perspective. So the second person is Frank uh, Wisner uh, Frank is a diplomat by his career and uh, he's been serving in a, in a number of uh, U.S. administrations and uh, has been working, if I recall, with uh, the Reagan administration, the Clinton one, and uh, finally, I think he was sent in the Obama administration with the, uh, the problem of Egypt just in 2011, if I recall. So uh, that was the time where Egypt was uh, having a uh, big problem and uh, and then the Muslim members that were taking, taking the, the cover at time. So then, Priya Ray is there just to, to my right, and uh, he's the executive uh, by chairman, I think, who is president of the uh, Apollo Hospitals. Uh, Apollo Hospitals are uh, very, very large uh, uh, healthcare organizations in India. Uh, what we found of interest was that. Uh, the, the activities in telemedicine, and uh, was very impressed about that. And uh, secondly, uh, they are they, they have a brand called uh, Apollo uh, Pharmacy, pharmaceutical pharmacy, and, and they have uh, some uh, thousand uh, outlets in India, and uh, they, they are very, uh, a very important uh, healthcare organization. There. Then uh, to my right, uh, also DJ. It's very difficult to pronounce the name. I will try. So, shall I say, say well, something like that. I, I, I remember many, many years ago I was working for the European Institute and uh, because uh, in my background I had uh, one thing. I, I, I'm an engineer, so I was working just building a satellite and a navy phone that in my division there was uh, some four to five. British people from uh, in the origin, and uh, and their names were always very difficult to pronounce. So, Doctor South uh, uh, Wales uh, is uh, a scientist, uh, a recommended scientist in India, I think, uh, in the in the area of uh, molecular biology, and uh, he moved to other activities, and uh, and he's very much engaged in. In dealing with the Indian diaspora, and, and uh, in order to try to to have the Indians uh, connected to the to the my country, something very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been, uh, for example, uh, uh, we had uh, an office in, in the Emirates in Dubai, 
in that area in that part of the world. There are many Indian people, and uh, I'm particularly, I've been married to some uh, Indian, <coughs> Indian people in the, in the finance industry, and they are not very much connected to, to India, I would say. So, uh, uh, looking just uh, a few weeks ago, looking at the uh, GCP, I found that uh, you have written a very interesting book called The Mori Doctrine, and uh, so, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it's a very interesting one, by the way. So, and finally, Mukagi, and uh, I think you well. And uh, he's the president, the CEO of uh, the U.S. India Today Policy Forum. He has been always dealing with the U.S. India Today, and uh, something that uh, I found uh, very promising, but the way for the both countries, not for. Only for India, but also for the United States. But it will be well, okay, this way, the United States and, and China are uh, complaining, I would say, that they got comments about the uh, uh, number of uh, cases. Um, so um, let's start you know, this, uh, this closing uh, session, which is going to be devoted to a um, you were the last one, so if you like, you can do it. Yeah. 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 The reason why the vice president of the CIA is the CEO of the team. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to be talking today about uh, this uh, trade to, to match, uh, to combine the, the growth of India as uh, one of the, the, the largest economies in, economies in the world in, the, in a few years. Uh, keeping with the, the harmony, the agriculture, uh, the way of doing, and, uh, and then including the, uh, the modernity that uh, I can uh, ask for. So uh, I will start just uh, uh, putting on the table a number of questions, and uh, my, my first question to, to Peter Ray, and, uh, and then I'd like uh, her yes, to be talking to do about uh, three items uh, in fact uh, very important in this days in India. And one thing is the increase in employment, so the way India can uh, train the people and uh, to accommodate the people into the, the new uh, technology, I would say. Secondly, the, the health care uh, insurance, something that uh, is, uh, in my opinion, key in you know, order to modernize India. And finally, something that we just have found very, very interesting, uh, which is uh, what you call no more darkness in India homes. So, apparently, India and homes are lacking in electricity, and therefore, this would be an effort, a special effort, just to, uh, to introduce the electricity into India homes. So, here, Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the topic is interesting because we're talking about uh, modernity on one side and then we're talking about harmony. It's not really a paradox, but uh, just one quick input is that India was actually a land of uh, spiritual, economic, and social harmony till maybe uh, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, it was the bedrock of where almost eight religions uh, bore fruit and have flourished beyond our borders. So it is a country with deep rooted spiritualism, and it's not about religion, but it's about the spiritualism. So I think when that is there, harmony should actually follow naturally. And uh, somewhere along the road, we might have lost it. And the reason why I think that, you know, the harmony in a nation of 1.3 billion people can be better is that they have to be gainfully occupied. And that is why this whole issue of unemployment keeps coming up so much because, you know, we have the, we're going to have the largest group of uh, English-speaking youth in the world, even though we're not an English-speaking nation. Uh, we have a diversity in terms of, you know, um, religious, not religious, but just social habits, um, 
they're completely different from the south and the north, but people who exist. And the mind, some of the best Indian brains actually man the top, um, the top organizations globally, you know. Um, I'd love to say it, but in the US, I would say that anyone who's done amazingly well is probably of Indian origin. So, so yeah, so, you know, we have a lot within our country. And how do we address these issues? Uh, health and education is a fundamental human right. How do we provide access to 1.3 billion people? The simple arithmetic is that there's about 100 million who can go anywhere in the world for health care. There's another 600 million who will find health care in some way or some sort within our country and find methodologies, some third-party payment to pay for it. But there's a whole lot remaining. There's half of India's population who has absolutely no access to quality health care or good clean drinking water for that matter. So I think the challenge could also be an opportunity to find solutions for that. And there are multiple uh, recommendations. There's, there's a lot of thought process. Uh, our uh, Prime Minister, Ayushman Bharat, was daring. Uh, it was heartbreaking. But for those who think that if, you know, we find answers in 24 months or even five years, I don't think so. But it's something that 15 years, 20 years from today will make a huge difference. There will be a time in India if everything goes well that, like we say, BC and AD, we will say pre Ayushman Bharat and post Ayushman Bharat. But to do that, I think, uh, you know, everything it has to be like a finely conducted orchestra and everybody has to play ball. And hopefully it will happen. I'm an optimist. Most Indians are optimists, by the way. So I think, you know, on the health part, we have answers now. We have people listening, and we have people who are wanting to do so. I think we will see a change. Uh, on the skilling, I think that is something which uh, has suddenly come up over the past uh, five, six years. We never realized the wealth we had in our youth, and we have to find methodologies to gainfully employ them. Because, you know, India as a country, we look at China and we say, oh my God, look at their economic prosperity. We actually haven't even mined for gold in our own country, and I'm hoping we will do it. Uh, we need 40 million health, uh, health skilled workers. That's the data which is coming up from, I think it was BCG or one of those. But if we can even scale one tenth of that number, we will be able to do a lot. If we can scale even more, we can probably provide the uh, manpower in the healing space for the rest of the world. So I think the opportunities are there, and skilling is extremely important. Electrification, rural electrification. There's so many new technologies which can actually help with that. It is sad when a child has to read, uh, not able to get the best in school, and then have to read by a gas pump to go for exams. So I think rural electrification for multiple reasons is, is a need. But what is surprising is that even urban electrification in some areas is a big challenge. So I think that's why I said I don't want the dark country. We have to be able to go anywhere. I mean the farmers have to run their farm sets if they have to if we have to talk about agriculture. So to me these are the three priority areas which really is about modernity. But I think by being modern in our thinking and forward thinking, we will come back to being a landed family. And, and, and that's why I thought it was a very serious Challenge that is delivered now, and that's that's critical. But more importantly, I think uh, we have to find a balance which is domestic and international, because 
the country needs a large number of FDI and technology to keep on growing economic growth in itself. And Modi 2 is not just about domestic agenda, it's about the rise of India and the role it's going to play in the regional environment. Uh, we at uh, US India Strategic Partnership Forum basically work with two principles with the Modi government. One is a military strong India is good for regional stability. And as we work with the member companies, we work on the legislative side to make sure India is getting the latest technology coming in and, uh, and more defense cooperation between the US and India itself because they're aligned interests itself. I think the second principle we work is that economic growth of India is good for US companies itself. Uh, when I say that, if you look at the companies such as Google, Amazon, Uber, uh, WhatsApp, they dominate the Indian domestic market and they are completely shut out from the Chinese market. So India is open for business from that perspective. I think the challenge, and I think Frank will uh, repeat that, is that as we move forward between India and the US, the geopolitical relationship is very strong and going very, very well. If you look at the last uh, two, three years, India and US have signed some of the uh, Palm Casa, Lenoir agreement where more exchanges are taking place. In fact, if you look at the last uh, 18 months, more joint exercises have taken place between India and the US than any other countries uh, out there itself. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo is in India on Wednesday itself. And you will see India placing large orders on some of the latest technologies coming in. I think the challenge part is on the trade side. And normally, you know, the way I see it is, is uh, because they're irritant on the trade side, it's like the tail wagging the dog. Because geopolitical strategic relationships are much more important. But we have a president in the U.S. who believes that uh, tariffs and trade are more important or same level itself. So I think we have to find a way uh, how you basically avoid the conflict so it does not impact on the geopolitical side. And, and I think the distance are not that good. I think uh, when you look at the, the uh, yes, yes, uh, President Trump keeps on talking about Harley Davidson. And I think uh, our recommendation make that zero. So India only imports 86 Harley Davidson uh, into India on an annual basis. But I think the issues on ICT tariffs, issues on medical devices prices, the issues on, on agriculture, those are, when you look at it in detail, uh, those are not major issues, and I think the business groups can work with the government to find the solution itself. So, from our perspective, Modi PO is, is going to play a very pivotal role, both in domestic growth and on global uh, role of India as a regional stable power itself. Now, how, how, let me, we, we get to question the South Asian in the game, and uh, on the one side, uh, in India is part of the great understand that, you know, we have a 3,000 kilometer long border with China. And China is way, way ahead economically and military itself. And we have to find a balance in a way that uh, we don't have what you call a conflict taking place. You also have to understand China plays a very critical role back in Pakistan. I mean, if you look at what happens in the, uh, you know, when they try to label Jai Shomer, uh, but as a terrorist group, and China kept on objecting to that. And they tried to come into national uh, legal supply group as well. China kept on finding excuses and there was no come to that. Um, so we have to find a way. But you have to understand, culturally, language wise, we tend to pivot more with the US. And, 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 and the reason I say that is, is you have 4 million American Indians, which play a very, very strong role, uh, both in the political arena, as uh, Peter said earlier, in the business community. You know, one out of eight medical doctors in the U.S. today are of Indian origin itself. You look at the Fortune 500 companies, almost 10% are 
are in the top tier management. Yes, we hear about folks like Indra Nui, Ajil Banga, or Satya Nadella, or Sundar Pichai, but I think they're, you know, ten times more in, in the second level of, of the organization itself. So I think uh, with 200,000 students for India are uh, in the U.S. study and many STEM program and they contribute roughly $9 billion to the local economy. And, and most of them come back and they become goodwill ambassadors for the United States and India. So I think that as, as Prime Minister Modi said and also Trump, or, sorry, President Obama also said, we are natural allies. And I think there's more synergy with both these countries together trying to solve global issues and each other's issues rather than trying to play the star of China and U.S. Uh, versus itself. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, the indicated uh, actions that have been taken and the discussion is crossing uh, to the global supply chain is also an opportunity for India. India has always uh, uh, played below its potential as far as uh, being part of the global supply chains are concerned. Because uh, what India brings to the table is a large and growing domestic market. So anybody who wants to set up any facility can build to scale. Uh, looking at the domestic market and then the competitiveness that is required to survive in the international market. So I do see this as an opportunity and now with the stable government continuity of policy, actions being taken to formalize the economy more and uh, a lot of actions being taken to improve the ease of doing business and hopefully over the next few years to improve the cost of doing business. I think the prospects are good for uh, investors to come into India build world-class facilities. The auto industry in India is a great example of uh, the best in the world coming and creating world-class facilities in India and exporting out of India. And I think it's, uh, it's a good model to try and replicate because we need jobs in India uh, and you have 60 to 65 percent of the population living off the land and uh, they are not going to still the transition to a service economy so easily. Manufacturing plays a very important role in being the bridge between agriculture, agrarian-based economy and a services-led economy. So I think uh, it's important for us to have a lot more private sector investment in India. Most of the investments over the last few years have been more public sector investments. And if that comes in, more opportunity to create jobs and create world-class companies out of India and plug into the global supply chain is a great opportunity to do. Please do take the time to discuss our so from my vantage point, so I live in Silicon Valley and, you know, and kind of looking at India from there and, you know, having lived in India in my earlier part of my life and then moving to the U.S. So I see tremendous kind of uh, opportunities for India ahead. And uh, the, the three things that come to my mind is, firstly, India is answers kind of lie in really leveraging it the startup economy. I feel India is a land of entrepreneurs, whether we recognize it or not. Somebody said yesterday that there are 7,000 startups, and then somebody else in all said, no, there's 3 million of them, because you have to start to look at the, the unlabeled startups, the people who are not even recognized entrepreneurs in the Indian economy. So, so I think looking at the startups and figuring out how that can be supported and leveraged into the future is going to be a critical part of India's story. The second thing which I feel is India is extremely well poised is, is you know, leveraging the, the population dividend. And it has been used, the population dividend has been used in multiple ways, but I want to look at it from the angle of data. So the data is the new oil, and you may have heard this phrase, it's the new oil. This is going to be the basis of how energies and economies are going to get fueled. With a billion and 1.3 billion people, we can ethically, with privacy, really kind of monetize and build a data model that allows us to meet that critical services like health that you know, Peter was, he was talking about. And this is a major opportunity for us because nowhere else in the world where we could actually take data and make sense out of it to improve human condition at scale for 1.3 billion people. And the learnings from that can be applied in a forward thinking way to every other part of the globe. So, so the data is the new oil. India is sitting with plenty of that as part of a population dividend, and we need to learn to figure out how to do the most with it. And last but not least, I think India has 
tremendous opportunity to streamline how to make doing business in India a little bit more streamlined and simpler. If we do these three things in my mind, you know, we will climb over to our next set of leadership where the debate is not going to be about U.S. and China. It's going to be U.S., China, and India at the table in the right way of talking about how the world should be reshaped and thinking. And I think India has tremendous potential in that way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And then, how do you think uh, the, the Indian the last one could uh, just uh, bring up in, in this uh, in this two things, so from the one side, so investing in India, so the other side, more learning in India, and uh, also the uh, combination between uh, the United States and India based on data. So, uh, First of all, one needs to understand that the uh, Indian diaspora is not homogeneous as many people think. Uh, it's quite heterogeneous. There are people who have gone out of India for 100, 150 years. Uh, they still have some connection to India, but many of them, they have lost their connection. And from that, to the doctors and nurses, they have come to U.S. and then IT and then new entrepreneurs, hoteliers in U.S. Uh, and you will be surprised to know that there are in Israel there are close to 80,000 Jews of Indian origin. Uh, and then there are 10,000 nurses who are Indian passport holders who are serving uh, in Israel for the elderly population. So it is very diverse. So therefore, there cannot be a one solution or one team which can attract everyone. Each one has a different interest. Uh, different connection, with, uh, and therefore their demands are also very diverse. But one thing is very clear that in spite of generations for which they have not been connected to India, for example, those in Suriname and Western Ireland, they still cherish their Indian origin. And that, from that to the most modern CEOs uh, like the Canada, who is really a very cricket player. Uh, Fan, and we're claiming that uh, India and England will have the final in the World Cup. Uh, so, uh, this entire spectrum is not shy of their Indian identity, except like someone like Bobby Jindal, who is <laughs> uh, etc. So, this is the real strength of India. I think that after interacting with so many of them, one of the good things and one of that is becoming a strength is that. Indians are very comfortable with multiple identities. So they are as good a US citizen, but at the same time, uh, they are proud of their Indian heritage and Indian culture and the values. Uh, so, on one side, India, uh, Indian diaspora is the biggest champion of India's soft power. On the other side, they, because of their technological excellence, they are bringing a lot of values. In India, especially after liberalization of economy. And that is also coming a lot of American companies to India. There is a very famous conversation uh, with uh, Jack Walsh uh, when Mr. Uh, Dr. Mushalkar presented what India can do. They had original plan of opening a small center of field, scientists in India, Bangalore. And then he said, he is, India is so good. Why 50? Why not 500? Today, you might not be aware that Intel's second largest R&D center, it is not a low-end job, is in Bangalore, which, and they are recruiting 3,000 people. So this reverse flow is also becoming, because of this NRI, they have shown their intellectual capabilities and power. What is, and then there is a third layer, which is a very below the radar philanthropic activities that MRS do it in their places of origin. And it is highly undocumented. And more number of people I meet across the globe, I am astonished the number of the amount of contribution they have done in Andhra, in Gujarat, in Tamil Nadu, in Punjab, Haryana, where they have opened the schools, they have renovated the hospitals, they have built the effective tanks into it. And Lot of things they have done. In Gujarat, there are several private universities that are fully funded by NRS. And these are our real strengths. And I guess what is required to do is to do is 
it should take it to the next level of very emerging technology. So, for example, Michael Peng earlier was we were talking today that how we can leverage the India's technological potential into the IT field because that is something which we are going to need and the conventional IT training that is being taken that is being imparted in India may not be sufficient and actually it is not sufficient. Similarly, in the case of telemedicine, uh, there is enormous potential to do it with the help of diaspora uh, with so many doctors. So, I was actually talking to Aapti, for example, that what they can do with the Indian doctors, which is one of the, as he said, we want to make doctors of Indian origin. Uh, whether Aapti can, Aapti doctors or in, doctors of Indian origin sitting in U.S. through telemedicine, through technology, can they help uh, patients in India to so, uh, right diagnosis and uh, right kind of treatment. So, unfortunately, enormous technology is enabler and Indian heritage uh, and their uh, compassion and passion for India origin make the basis for all this. So I guess uh, you will see many more avenues of uh, uh, collaboration both at the informal and formal level between Indian diaspora and Indian, uh, Indian in general uh, in the years to come. And also thanks to Mr. Modi who has made that engagement as an essential part of uh, his foreign trip. Uh, in my role, I was fortunate enough to be a part of this celebration. I myself must have attended some 25 odd uh, interactions of that uh, with Mr. Modi and even partly tried to coordinate this. And I saw tremendous uh, affection and love for Mr. Modi and a real hope in him. Uh, it is our responsibility now to use up to that hope and uh, expectation. And I'm sure in this four five years, I am very optimistic about the uh, Indian diaspora. Thank you. 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 Thank Really, we have two days quite fascinating discussions and come away with some important conclusions. Um, I believe we could all agree as we look back over these past two days that we find India in a very good place. Her traditional endowments, the election of her prime minister, despite the huge list of issues that she has to address, she's in a good situation. I certainly come away reinforced in that view. And that there's a promising path ahead. But I think it's also fair to say, as we look back over these last two days, that there are issues of substantial. Concern that we are wrong not to underscore, to put our eye to. And hmm, I recognize that the job the Prime Minister, his government, and all of you as Indian businessmen, community leaders, have in front of you as we seek to absorb a million new Indians a month into your workforce and move people from cities to country. There's a lot of demand. High expectations and a lot of pressure to deliver outcomes. And that creates with it a degree of anxiety and potentially some instability. And it means we don't have a lot of time to breathe. But if I look at the risk on the Indian side, I look globally, and I believe we also heard about the gathering storm clouds on the global economy against which India must register for progress. We are facing, at some point, quite understandably, a growing global economy. But I think we're facing also a time of heightened global political and military risk. We don't have to exaggerate the problems between my country, the United States, and China, or the tensions in the Gulf these days uh, between Iran 
uh, Saudi Arabia, ourselves, the nations of the Gulf, Israel, nor do I have to point to many other examples of civil war revolution. This is not an easy world to live in. We are facing trouble in Europe as Europe tries to work its way through hugely complex passages. And so when I come back to India and I think about what we've talked about in the last two days, I come to a conclusion that the first job an Indian government has to do is to secure its citizens, to secure its borders, to secure India's place in the world. That's the essential and first step. And then flows all the other steps of securing national harmony, the health, the education, the welfare of the citizenry. Now, securing India's place in the world has in recent years become a serious issue of conception, of grand strategy. And as I see India's place in the world today, and the challenge to India's leaders is to maintain a degree of balance. Balance with strong relations with the United States, open and good relations with Europe, ties to China, ties to Russia, so that India is protected by having balance in all directions. But of all the issues of balance, the one that is most important in my judgment is one that has preoccupied me for 25 years, and that's the United States Indian connection. Why do I say that? Because I believe we and you have found each other late in the day, but that we offer each other reciprocal strength. We offer each other defense security, economic security, technology transfer, movements of population, the U.S.-India relationship is one that needs to be strong so that the rest of the balance between India and the world work out. Now, it is with that, as I look back a year ago, when Franz Richter asked me that to sum up, I looked at the U.S.-India relationship with some optimism. I have to say this year, I am less optimistic. And I believe it's worth all of us reflecting on what's going on and what we need to do, not just with governments, but with business communities and with citizens, to make sure this key underpinning is working. So, Mukesh has described a number of the problems that are roiling the relationship. I think you've described quite accurately on the Indian side. Deep irritation. The United States pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. The United States insisted that India give up oil imports from Venezuela, from, from Iran. The United States complains about acquisition of sophisticated military systems from Russia, $12 billion of new acquisitions. The United States has a lot to complain about, say, Indian public opinion. And it doesn't seem right. And yet on the American side, there is a growing crescendo of complaints as well. Tariffs that we didn't anticipate. Data, localization issues that are really very serious and hard to address. Traditional problems in agricultural exports. Traditional problems in medical devices and other sensitive trade items. Even seemingly trivial items like motorcycles are like On both sides of the ledger, there has been a growing over the past 12 months, a growing sense of irritation, and a growing sense of Indian election and Donald Trump pursuing other uh, issues around the world. That we're not, nobody's paying the kind of attention to these issues and getting them back on track so that we preserve this critically important relationship. And so let me close with a thought for you, because I believe it is an important subject, and I'd like to 
have all of you think about how best to handle it. I believe, first and foremost, the U.S. India relationship cannot just be left to solve itself. And it's not one side has to give and the other side receive. And it has to be addressed quickly. And it has to be addressed by government. And Hughes Goyal has got to go to Washington and Mr. Lighthizer has to sit down. And the President and Narendra Modi have to come to a strategic understanding. But I believe as well that the issues involved are of a complexity that they will not only be solved by government. If I think of the most sensitive issue today, it would be that of localization. And that issue is one that government still understand. And if we fall to say, you can't have data, I'll keep mine, you can't have access to it. I'll punish you if you don't share data. We're going to be in very serious trouble. And so I think the business community of our two countries has a core responsibility to join this debate with government. It's not just a job for USTR and South Park, but it's a job for the entirety of our business community because our economy and our strategic interests are So my appeal is as we leave here today, go back home to our respective side of the world, that we keep an eye on making sure this relationship is not getting better. And the rough passages we're going through right now are double. Well, thank you, Frank. Uh, would you like to say something? No, I think you know you underscored a very, very important point is here. What is actionable by the business community, and I can speak on their behalf. You know, figuring out the data localization and how to govern data in a way that India and US can preserve and actually <laughs> develop the relationship with the next frontier as data is the main oil, geopolitical, power base, economic prosperity, a lot of those things will be governed by data. India has a pivotal role to play, and we need to take a forward leaning stance on this, and I think everybody here can play a role in that. So. You know, I, I, let's bring that speak to this because we've had a lot of conversations on that. So one question. Yeah. 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 Is, uh, why would India give up data, which, you know, you said is oil and, you know, it's got wealth and legacy and so on and so forth, to any country, let alone the U.S.? Because if uh, India as a country has to monetize its data, it should stay within Indian soil. So is there a way where we can actually, you know, uh, use what we have in terms of data, if that is the new goal, and try and see that all the issues which India really needs for progress, which really needs people to invest in, and can you make it a better place by... Uh, not taking away our data, but uh, by maybe helping India use our data better to do something like that. I think that today uh, the value of data is much more than it's flowing. If you balkanize it, then its value can kind of drop. And also today, there are more data which goes from U.S. into India than India into the U.S. because of the deep industry, IT industry. And uh, I think trying to balkanize uh, may not be the right direction to go. I would say that to leverage that data, if the private sector can come in and play a pivotal role, because governments don't understand the ever-changing possible technology environment. And, and to ensure that India has access to it. We have suggested to the government, why don't we have a mirroring concept for all the data stays in India while it's also in the cloud? And I'll give a very classic example of credit card companies such as MasterCard or Visa. If you cut off India from the global cybersecurity, when a card is stolen in India within two hours being used in London or in Moscow, uh, then you don't get that protection itself. So I think there's a solution to make sure the data stays in India, 
and they'll get value to that data. And I think that's where uh, private companies can come in and play a very good role supporting that vision. Also. Mm-hmm. Well, think I'm, I'm going to have a point because you put your finger on something that's quite sensitive. Uh, at first blush, it's Indian data. Why can't Indian use it and exploit it? And I think if, you, if we pause for a second and think, no man's an island. This is an interlocking, interdependent world in which we share so much, and if we don't share it well, we're in trouble. Can you imagine if we don't keep control of this issue? What would happen if the Americans said, well, we can't use data from India? Why should we send data to PCS to be processed in India? Is that the world we want to live in? I would think our objective would be a maximum system of data sharing where all of us have keys to secure data, not that data is a national asset to be jealously guarded by any sovereign entity. But I come back to a core argument. This would be a question to see the data question cloud the strategic importance of the U.S. and the relationship. I'd like, I'd like to pick something, something different from the time. Yeah, I'd love to talk because it definitely is a point for great arguments. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we are just uh, talking about India, the space, and the Russia, and China. And I think that uh, we are biting just uh, from, from the list to the one. And, uh, but we are in your uh, particular space. So uh, then, uh, I'd like you to comment on, on the role you may envision in to set you up in this kind of new uh, Indian balance because uh, uh, particularly the, the British are uh, uh, just uh, living somewhere and uh, Britain is the is, uh, is, uh, type of state you are kind of uh, uh, it's a country, I would say, it's not a country, but it's a country. And uh, so, how do you feel this is the role of your in this type of thing? Uh, and then we will talk about the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, my name is Clay Boyd, and we are talking UK Parliamentary Group, and your back has set up a committee to review India UK relations. And just today, they have released their report. Coincidentally, this week is also being celebrated in London as a UK India week, which is represented by my close friend Mona Jarva, and I will be attending that from tomorrow. But the key aspect, key finding of the UK parliamentary group is that UK is mostly to blame for overall reduction of cooperation between India and UK. Two years back, when British reporter came to me, and she was a very like, young reporter, and she was patiently asking me about what would happen to UK and the free trade agreement. And I said, nothing is going to happen for three years at least. So she was very disappointed. And I told her that uh, Britain is simply is not coming out of Brexit for the next couple of years. And uh, the deterioration started when, unfortunately, British Prime Minister Theresa May visited India after it was the first visit outside Britain after she became Prime Minister. And in her very first speech in Delhi, she talked about immigration, which was not a major issue. And essentially, she took that as the top of her agenda. But what that has resulted into significant reduction of number of students that go into the UK because they were denied even the work experience after their degree, um, less investment either side, and then there were so many other issues with uh, my friend from Qatar I explain more than you. So the ball essentially is in UK's court what to do. There is a lot of symbolism there, say, Commonwealth and etc. Uh, but Commonwealth will also have to write find its purpose again, which was simply being the symbolism, that kind of thing. 
As far as rest of the Europe is concerned, we have very good relations with France. We have major defense deal with France. Personal chemistry between Mr. Macron and Mr. Macron and Mr. Modi is very good. With Angela Merkel and Chancellor Angela Merkel also, India is German relations are good. So all major power in Europe, we have individual relations are very good. We are again not able to tie up EU as a single entity. Part of it also was to do something totally unrelated to in Italy because some uh, army men from Italy were being prosecuted in India and because of that, at least for one year, EU said that we won't negotiate anything unless you resolve this issue. So we have lost some time, but uh, once EU in general and UK some sort of this Brexit, I won't call it technically a mess, but whatever it is, uh, I'm sure uh, it won't take much time to Thank you. 
one area which we discussed uh, with the Minister in the morning as well was in the same area of technology because uh, Spain has uh, uh, a kind of technology led ecosystem. In fact, uh, I know for a fact that we have a speed we work with some of the companies. Uh, uh, just like in the UK, there are many ecosystems here where the industry and the uh, government and uh, research agencies, uh, you know, it's about commercializing research and technology. And there's a lot of work which goes on in Spain. So that is an area. In fact, one of the proposals we had is, uh, uh, you know, CII and the government of India does a technology kind of uh, creates a technology platform and does an event every year. And then we have partner countries from the US and the UK and Netherlands and France and all that. And we've invited that to be requested that Spain can consider that. So that's certainly an area. There was a suggestion from the uh, minister over here from Punjab on whether India and Spain can work together on agriculture. Uh, so that's another area where uh, I think uh, some work can be done. And the third suggestion which came up was how can we leverage the integrity of South Africa and Latin America? So we can give some points. Thank you. These are all very positive ways Spain and India can work together. But you know, when I, I come and I think all of us can appreciate it, we use Spain in truly an ancient and very rich civilization of how important it is for India to have wise and good friends in South Africa. Uh, there is a huge challenge in front of us, and that is in how India is going to place their place in the world, how India is going to enter one day into a free trade agreement with Europe. As the minister pointed to this morning, I don't pretend to have for tomorrow morning or evening that Spain is the leading voice in Europe. To have Spain on your side when it comes to the European Commission is a very good place to be. And so I would think you're very lucky to have such good friends, and I'd make the best of it. It's certainly been the American experience with Spain ever since the mid 1950s, when Spain was isolated, and we reached out to Spain. Our friendship has been reciprocated ten times over. By our Spanish friends. So I can tell you, it's, you'll find the same and more. So just thank you, Frank. Any final words from, from this side? We, are, we have one minute, and I'm aware you would like to say something. Yeah, well, I'll before we leave. Yeah, I'd like to congratulate Frank and the team for setting up this annual event. My recommendation would be to some kind of action item which follows up. Uh, as a team, a working committee, we come back next year and we achieve this. So I think that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Well, thank you to you all, and thank you very much for the audience. And uh, I think we are more like combined. And uh, so uh, we close the session and then enjoy the meeting we are later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.